If the last 12 months have taught us anything, it's that work can be done from anywhere by anyone. But by implication of that, that creates great labor flexibility in terms of people in their own countries. But if work can be done by anyone anywhere, then that may result in the work moving to different places. One of those hot topics that's come up in recent years is something called a robotic process outsourcing center, as well as outsourcing labor as well. Today, I'm going to work with Mahesh, and him and I are going to talk about the BPO industry and the RBBO industry. Uh, Mahesh, for those people who don't know who you are, would you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about you and your background? My name is Mahesh Vinayagam. Uh, I'm originally from Chennai, India, uh, where there is a huge BPO industry, uh, we are, since we're talking BPO. Um, I'm an engineer uh, by education. Um, and about uh, 20 years ago, I moved to the UK and I worked with an um, outsourcing organization uh, on their technology uh, pieces. Then about uh, 14 years ago, I moved to the US and I'm based here in Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm now the CEO and founder of Cubotica. Um, we see Cubotica as an um, alternative to um, outsourcing work. Um, we want to obviously provide uh, automated services. So that's where we are at this moment. So that's kind of a brief about me. And apart from uh, what I told, I'm also actively working with the community, uh, whether it's during the COVID times or working with the high school kids and kind of mentoring them or uh, mentoring budding entrepreneurs uh, and career professionals to switch into entrepreneurship. So I work with uh, a number of different community groups like Seedspot, FBLA, uh, Techstars, and so on. You and I uh, spoke a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about the BPO industry. Would you mind reminding everyone how and why the BPO industry uh, grew? In the last 30 years, um, if we saw the technological improvements grew phenomenally, right? So there is a number of enterprise software and so many options available to customers. One of the promises or premise of technology was to replace human labor. However, while the technology grew phenomenally and exponentially, the BPO industry also grew uh, along with it. And where we see, see the reason is because as the technology products grew, it was not really completely replacing the human work um, to an extent. It is actually creating more work for humans to kind of, uh, I don't know, run those particular software and also hack like the middleman. So let's maybe, you know, we can't give a dare credit to that, but perhaps, uh, you know, some of it would be to, to the, due to the growth in, in, in fact of consumerism and consumers using the technology products. But there is a huge uptake uh, because there is disparate technologies grew. So the BBO industry really has grown um, in ways that we would not expect. Uh, but when we look at the BPO, Mahesh, it was driven, not the technology has allowed it, but arguably at the start, uh, what drove the adoption was wage arbitrage. Is wage arbitrage still a huge thing or a, a significant deciding factor? Or has, uh, for example, the India BPO market moved up the value chain? Absolutely. See, India's uh, economy has grown the last decade or so, and it's now a you know a, one of the you know growing superpowers if you see in the world. So, and then there's a lot of activity uh, within the country that's happening, uh, whether it's entrepreneurship and you know uh, lots of growth within the country. So, the wage levels had to increase uh, to kind of commensurate with the stronger economy that they're facing. So, which means that the wage arbitrage that's out there has really been reduced. And similarly for, uh, for many other countries, um, I think the pure play data entry work, um, you know, it's no more uh, kind of provides uh, the same arbitrage that companies enjoyed about 20 years ago or 15 years ago. So where do you see the BPO market going? What's the next phase of its evolution? There are two ways the BPO market is going. So one is on the automation side and the other is on the gig side, okay? And there's obviously, there's gonna be the middle, um, uh, uh, what, what's the current scenario that's happening right now. 
So let me talk about a gig side that's not related to this uh, particular conversation, but still, you know, um, options like Mechanical Turk are obviously providing companies the option. And if they are able to uh, protect the security of their data and access and all that. So, so there is like, if it is pure play work and that needs to be done in a certain amount of time and it's a fixed scope and pure entry, you, anybody can do it. it. Doesn't need to be, you don't have to actually choose a vendor to you know, can undergo a, an option of retention and you know, all that kind of stuff. You could actually go that gig role. But let's kind of that's kind of small percentage of the market that's going to take it, but still a significant percentage. Uh, but then the current uh, way of doing work is not going to be sustainable. And okay? so you either go that way or you have to adopt automation. So there are so many options available for the machines to do certain things themselves. You know, if you program it to do, you know, things like entering, entering data, uh, comparing data. And nowadays, with the advance of AI and machine learning, you could actually be, uh, you could actually understand patterns, recognitions. So like, for example, at Kubatica, we do right now unstructured email parsing. So the emails are pretty much the same. They're asking for quotes. They keep asking for quotes. And if you, and this, if you are able to understand this over a period of time, you'll be able to decipher what's the information that's on the email. So that's what that's a use, usually a BPO job. Uh, but I think now, with the advance of the technology uh, available, we could actually have a machine do it. So I ask you the question then, what does the future look like? Do we actually need people, number one, or will we see BPOs evolving into RBPOs? And that's robotic business processing, processing outsource centers. Right. I think, see, the concept needs to change from outsourcing into bot sourcing. So instead of having to um, you know, do the work um, by humans, like today the outsourcing is all about humans or maybe a company that actually kind of lives a particular process and performs this, you could actually have bot sourcing and the bot sourcing could be insourced into your organization, but still leverage a partner to kind of really lift those processes, automate it, create those bots or those functions, right? That will then be you know, hosted within the organization's network or in a network, like if it's a cloud, AWS cloud, then you know, within the control of the um, you know, the organization that's requiring the work so they could actually have full control over their information, their process and all that. And still it is run independently, like the same system, the sorry, standard operating procedures that you use to provide to humans to do the work. You could actually give it to a, a, a pro, uh, automated process which perform the exact steps. And it is just that instead of a human at 10,000 miles away, it's a machine that's going to perform that work keep the output data somewhere for you to look at it. And then you can then consume it back. So I think the bot sourcing op option needs to be uh, considered. And that's where like automation as a service comes in. I think um, today automation, if you see um, the robotic process automation, it's all done by in-house and trying to kind of really, our customers are um, really trying hard to make it work uh, within the organization. I think. They should now think about how do they actually outsource it um, to an external party, <laughs> consume that as a service. And like I said, you don't, when you say outsourcing, you don't have to push everything out. It could be done within your environment, but the, these external parties can just kind of come and configure those environments and do the entire work and maintain it over a period of time. So the, the key is um, having control um, and yet give the, freedom for those um, uh, external parties to own that process into it. What needs to change to make an RBPO work? Is it the SOPs need to change? Is it contracts need to change? Is it mindset? What do you think are the most important things that need to move to make this a success? Interestingly, the way that uh, the RBA principles work the SOPs doesn't need change. Obviously, you need to optimize uh, wherever it's needed. As in, as in any process, you need certain tuning. So the SOPs can stay as is. Um, 
the contracts, you know, today the contract's asking about certain work to be delivered. Um, if you have an FTE contract, then you should change. So that's definitely need to change. You don't need um, FTE heads. You'd rather want to say, I want to process so many transactions or um, uh, so much volume with certain amount of uh, accuracy or correction or whatever you want, whatever is method like exceptions, um, happy parts, how long do you measure it? So you would have a clear metrics. Um, so that's uh, a change on the contract side. And then what needs to change a big time is the mindset, right? So I think that is that is key for the success of this initiative. And in terms of earlier on, we were mentioning then work can be done anywhere by anyone. Now we've introduced the mix that robots can do the work from any place at any time. What do you think is going to be the implications for the labor market of RBPOs and work being able to be performed anywhere in the world at any time of day or night at a variety, I'm sure, of, of costs or low cost? Exactly. The same thing was, you know, talked about in digital transformation, right? So, you know, that, you know, having, you need to have your own native centers and, you know, you could always come to the office and do co-working, co-location, all of that stuff. But that what the last year and a half has proved it, all of that went through the window and suddenly we all able to kind of work uh, remotely and across, you know, I think people were moved from cities into uh, some you know states or you know smaller towns and happily working from there. People actually had a work vacation somewhere else and working from there. So I think that uh, that whole mindset that you know work needs to be done by humans it's out of the window, right? So and now um, I think the bots um, you know bots can can do it. You know it's just that you have to configure it. So you have to have the right testing. You know if you if you are able to. Um, measure the uh, outcome uh, quickly, you know, it will then run it, run it like same for the next 10 years. If things don't change, um, the bots will never going to make a mistake. You know, if it's, this is the input and this is the process and these are the deviations it can take and this is the output, it's going to do the same thing. But the same cannot be done for the humans because in the, in the 10 years of running the same process, you would have deterioration of service. That will never happen uh, with the bot Unless you know volumes grew crazily, if the systems that uh, process that's been you know uh, written on that changes uh, badly, but then with the right amount of support of the right partner that you have that can kind of really understands the change that's happening within your organization and tune those um, automations to, to respond to the bots. Or sorry, responds to the changes. You should be fine. In that instance, where we have worked from anywhere or worked on by our BPOs. What do the humans do? Haha, <laughs> yes, um, I missed that part of your question. Yeah, see, think about this. It, uh, the evolution, what is evolution is taught at is like, you know, humans survive, you know, like it's just like the, there's going to be enormous amount of work on the data preparation side. Today, when we're working with unstructured data, we need lots and lots of people to do annotations, right? So it's not like, the, the, the work, the human work has gone away. The human work would be redirected, recalibrated. And in fact, they will feel even better that the work that they are going to do, they're not going to do it forever. They're going to go and train something and then they're going to get one company out of the way. And you know, probably they would be, they would understand what's happening at the front end. So they would be able to add more value. So I think it is, the work will be redirected. It will never disappear. Yeah, I think in every digital revolution or or um, industrial revolution, more jobs have been created, which is which is good news for the humans. I think there as well. So, who is doing robots as a service really well? Who should companies be approaching, and what are the questions they should be asking? Yes. See, uh, there are like in a in a book that Jonathan uh, Serse, um, you know, he wrote the practical um, implementation to RPA. Um, in that book, like he kind of did a scan of the market and he couldn't find a lot of uh, RPA as a service uh, provider. You know, interestingly, he just found us, uh, Cubatica to be one of them. But in the last year and a half, I've seen that companies are actually going towards that route. Um, they haven't really pronounced it. Like, so I don't, I, there is no, there is no Gartner uh, quadrant or a Everest peak matrix for automation as a service market. 
but I believe that the organizations are going towards it. And I think um, the important qualification there should be, you know, that when these, um, these um, RP as a service or automation as a service is announced, clearly, um, you know, the, the, the entire construct of that particular uh, service should be measured in terms of the, the speed and the accuracy and the turnaround. So it could not be just like, say, like instead of 100 people, you are now going to do with, like, say, 30 people and some bots. Uh, that's not true revolution. True revolution would be like when 100 reduces to seven or six to just to manage the exceptions. The remaining 93 people work is actually really automated. So, um, or you could actually do, choose a completely new partner that will actually bring in the value, uh, you know, kind of really give a competition to the other player. So that can be done. So it is it is difficult for me to say, Jonathan, for that uh, question. So who is doing now? Because there is no really clearly uh, players crawling out. Uh, but over time, I'm sure um, it's just about time that market is going to come in and you're going to see a partner, uh, you know, quadrant or a HFS uh, uh, report on this. And if they hadn't yeah. written a report, I'm sure you and I could. It's an interesting market, I have to say. COVID has taught us a lot over the last 12, 18 months, and I like to take away the positive elements, which is work can be done from anywhere. If we can automate it, all the better. If we can put it into an RBPO, that would, I'm sure, solve and satisfy many companies' uh, challenges with offshore laboring or whatever else. But again, as you mentioned, Mahesh, if it can be done and built offshore and handed back or ran remotely, then there's no reason why AI and bots doesn't do the job that we currently do to free us up to do more interesting work. Appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you.